when he was doing it. His first book, Elements of Poker, was influential to me as a young person. And every year at the World Series, we meet up and we have coffee. But we can't go to the World Series this year. So here we are. Good morning, Tommy. How are you? Morning, Jonathan. Well, thank you. Excellent. I have a clip lined up that we made a few years ago at the World Series of Poker. I want to show that to everyone. It's on my phone. Hopefully it functions properly. Is that cool okay. with you? Sure. Let's see it. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, John. I'm here with the guru, Tommy Angelo. He has some advice for you today. Ready? Here's how to sit. Sit down. 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 <laughs> the end. <laughs> the end. What in the world is the purpose of that? This is great advice. You were sitting really well there. Um, I tried to have okay posture. I had very bad posture as a child, but then I, uh, my neck started hurting, so I figured I might as well fix it. So um, what's the purpose of that? Well, the, the idea there was, I think what you were doing was um, just asking for like quick, strong bits of advice, right, that everyone could use. And this is pretty much the best I got. And we're going to be talking a lot more about this. But um, the idea of uh, coming back to attention, coming back to focus when you're watching TV or you're wallowing over a bad beat or you just had a disturbing text with a friend and now the cards are being dealt. How do you get back to your A plus mindset at that split second? OK, well, most of the time we can't. But there are certain tools that we can deploy. And through my own personal experience and through coaching this very practice for 16 years now, I've had enough feedback in my little laboratory to come to believe that any time any poker player in between hands, we're talking about live poker right now, consciously decides to sit up straight, if they do nothing but that, absolutely nothing but that, that that has a some greater than zero chance of probability of bringing them back to their A game. OK, without that, you're just drifting as usual. You kind of have to wait till you win a pot or something. I don't know how you come back. <laughs> For sure. I think I think that's that's very, very good advice. You want to change your mindset is what it amounts to. If you're kind of annoyed or distracted about anything, you're going to find that poker right. may not be the absolute main focus at that point of time. Or, you know, if you're complaining about bad beats or something in your head, then like that's not yeah. going to do you any good. And you have to get back in the zone, get back in focus. And yeah. sitting up and straight is a great thing to do. Oh, it is. And what I want to go into today is actually why it works, why it's so effective. Um, but the, the idea of, um, you know, it, it isn't just bad beats. It's like boredom is a form of pain. Mm -hmm. That's a form of unhappiness. And as poker players, it's expensive. So, so that was one of my things long ago is like I need to just get past the boredom element so that I don't see flops when I shouldn't. This is when I was like, way, way back, right? <laughs> I knew boredom was a huge thing. And now as I've gotten into more coaching about the big stuff, the tilt and all this stuff. I realized, no, it's the, it's really the little things that are just as bad. And boredom is a huge one. And so the idea of coming back to focus on your body, it can be anything. It can be breathing, and which is great, mindful breathing, but that takes training to even be able to do that. Anybody has the wherewithal to sit up straight. In fact, a lot of times we do it without thinking about it. You know, like let's say you're sitting there like this and you, you play a hand sloppy, just one sloppy hand. And you're like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta wake up. I gotta revitalize. That's what I'm talking about, is doing that all the time. Like every single hand ultimately. Would be would be the way to keep from, you know, it isn't it, if you wait till you're like totally tilted and totally past the point of pain and all that. It's oftentimes impossible to recover when you're that far down. The idea of sitting up con constantly during the session over and over and over is to keep yourself like buoyed up mentally so that you don't ever even go down into the depths and have to, you know, do triage. It, you know. I Maybe I'm, I'm not correctly analyzing myself, but I feel like I never get down in the depths. But I don't think a lot of good poker players get all that down in the depths. They get like, you know, you're not playing perfectly, yeah. but you're, you're usually playing at least somewhat reasonable. You're never just going to jam with the 7-2 offsuit for fun or because you're bored, right? Oh, 
Well, but every... anything you do worse than your best play is yeah. not ideal, right? So right. it's like mental game training is something that's kind of like built into every very strong poker player because you realize you just can't lose your mind when you're playing poker because, like you said, it's really expensive. But what... well, except that I'm not talking to very strong <laughs> poker players right now. I'm talking <laughs> to true. average and bad players. You know, I mean, when I'm talking to you right now, I'm not thinking of world beaters. You know, they're not. They don't need coaching on on this kind of necess this kind of thing necessarily, and probably because they're probably already very consistent, which is why they're world beaters. It's inconsistency. You know, you can have a lot of players. I'm sure you've coached a lot of players that have a fine A game, but for them to optimize their earn rate, they just need to be more consistent. It's yeah. not necessarily a matter of making the A game 3% better. It's a matter of lopping off that 20%. So yeah, even though you and a lot of players might not go to where you're full blown tilt, that's kind of what I want to get away from. There's all kinds of versions of non A game that cost money. And that and the sitting up is one tool that can that can pull you out of it. That's so really I get emails a lot from people who say I, I do well early in the sessions and then inevitably stuff happens. Either I get bored or I lose a few hands and then I get annoyed and flustered. Then I go off the deep end. And right. someone sent me an email the other day saying that like, you know, I'm always, I always double or triple my money in a cash game early, but then I literally never leave with money. <laughs> right. What, what is happening to these people? Obviously you can't know cause you don't know these people, but what yeah. can these people do to fix these issues? Cause clearly something is happening to them. And like you said, it's probably boredom or some form of tilt. And, and yeah. really, is it just being aware of what's going on? And how do they not start going into the depths? How do you make it to where that does not happen? That takes, in my opinion, years of training, not weeks, not months, but years to eliminate it, to completely eliminate it. Okay. So with someone like that, the first thing I would be talking to them about is quitting. Okay. That's the one area where most people could improve the most is they get to a certain point and they know they're not playing their best and they know for sure if they were to just quit the game right then that their overall graph would be better okay yet we keep going that's because all of us have some amount of self-destructive tendency and poker brings out the best and worst in all of us and so if somebody's issue is they play great from seven o'clock to midnight and they play bad from midnight to three or whatever right then it's the the you could say the band-aid would be to quit at midnight i call it cinderella syndrome right just get out of there but in the heat of battle once we become lost in that cycle of defeatism or melancholy or whatever what defines that mindset is we are no longer in control of ourselves to to do the disciplines that we know we should do this applies to eating and everything right and so there's no way to fix that without a long range, highly dedicated, highly prioritized training plan. Okay, because what we're talking about is undoing the deepest, darkest parts of humanity, the part that makes us want to hurt other people and hurt ourselves. And there's no conversation with me or you that's going to fix that. Okay, so so like I said, there's all kinds of things. There's band aids. It depends on how much blood is being spilled at midnight. Right. Some people might be able to come up with a system where they're like, OK, I'm going to my wife's going to call me at 1130 and I have to leave at 12 or else she's not going to fix the pot roast I love or whatever. I mean, you can come up with all kinds of little <laughs> schemes to help with discipline in the short run. But none of those are going to fix the real problems that cause these these deep seated uh, self harming practices to take place. Well, so what? is the long-term solution then to help people get rid of those issues and also to help people just to develop discipline to do what they know they need to do because whenever i was a young poker player i would go to bellagio every day and i would play 5 10 no limit and mm -hmm. i had in my mind i would play noon until midnight every day unless the game was exceptionally soft in which case i would stay till like 6 a.m or if i ever got down forty five hundred dollars which was three buy-ins mm -hmm. in that game i would yeah. always quit and right. this is when I already thought I had a substantial edge on those players. And I thought even if I was stuck 4,500, I would play well. But yeah. quite often when you are stuck, maybe you're running bad. But at the same time, it's more likely you're just in a tougher game than average because you're losing. Right. And I knew that I was usually not enjoying myself when I was stuck $4,500. Right. And I would just get up and leave. And I, I did it literally perfectly for like you know the, the year that I sat there and I made... $400,000 or something in the year, just sitting there grinding five to no limit. 
Right. But I somehow naturally had that discipline. And yeah. maybe that's just because I knew through studying that if you do the right things and you make sure that you don't have like devastating losses, it's fine. But it's tough though, because I, I also recognize if I'm still playing well, I have a positive win rate, even stuck 4,500. Right, right. So why am I not just making the most out of that time? Uh -huh. So back then I did not take off days. I almost used my bad days where I just got stuck quick as my off days. So if I you know, started at noon, lost by 5 p.m., I would just leave. Right. Um, but anyway, well, what, what makes some people have that discipline and other people have it to some extent up until some point, and then some people just not have it at all? And how do the people who don't have it improve it? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of big questions there. First of all, you don't suffer it from the stuff that a lot of people do, right? I mean, you did that successfully. You might have had some chinks in your armor, a little here and there, but by and large, you just came into the game fundamentally disciplined in the first place. And that's one of the reasons you've had such great success. All of us bring certain qualities that are good for poker and not good for poker. <laughs> you know, most, some people are too conservative, some people too aggressive in their whole lifestyle or whatever. You know, you hear about people building up a million dollar bankroll, blowing it the next day. Um, why we have these self-destructive tendencies and why we want to play too long and get even and all that, I, I don't think that that's not, you know, my thing. I don't necessarily, I mean, there's plenty of information on that. I'm more about fixing it. <laughs> like, what can you do about it? Yeah, so how do we fix it? So, well, there you go. So, it, I, um, it, it comes down to, um, I'm going to just say the word meditation, okay? But it's more than that, okay? Meditation, it is in itself, isn't what helps people fix these things. It's the, um, it's the act of stillness, okay? So if you were to go and, and study, as I have, every, uh, many, many meditative practices, current and past, and various spiritual practices, whether it's Judaism or Catholicism or Muslim, and look at what they have in common, okay, like, and how, how these practices help people gradually become less unhappy. I like that phrase a lot better than become happy. Happy is hard to define. Very easy to understand what it means to be less unhappy, okay? And, and if you look at the one thing that they all have in common, it's training. OK, and the training, I was just watching a detective show last night and just a minor character. She's in this moment of great stress, learned about somebody dying. The first thing she does is she pulls out her rosary and now in that moment, she became less unhappy. Doesn't matter whether God exists or not. In that moment, she became less unhappy. OK, and the thing that she did that is the same as all practices is she stopped what she was doing and she stopped moving. So I've come to believe through my own experience and through teaching a lot of people about this for years now, almost all poker players, because I get a lot of feedback, that the essential element to meditative training that makes it work is the act of stilling yourself, of not moving. There's no way to do that accidentally. It's always on purpose, 100%, and that's what makes it training. If you want to build five pounds of muscle in your, in your arm, you're going to have to go like this a lot of times over years. If you want to lose 30 pounds of fat, you're going to have to be very disciplined and motivated and prioritize your diet day after day after day after day, right? That type of dedication and that type of fervor if it's applied to a meditative meditation practice, and by that I mean meditate every single day right when you get up, that plants a seed in your life of discipline that is so powerful and so strong that anything can grow from that. Uh, for example, you can learn how to learn, uh, uh, learn a musical instrument or learn a brand new poker game or learn a whole new skill that becomes your career if you do it every day, right? If you absolutely do it every day, seven days a week and never miss a day, anything's possible, okay? So that's the kind of training that makes it possible for a poker player to become someone who has all these 
neural pathways that have been reinforced in their mind that are all painful. All these buttons and all these triggers and they're mindlessly just being banged around by random events and, and fundamentally unhappy most of the time. That person over time can gradually change, literally change their brain, change their neural pathways, change their perception of reality so deeply that they can be content at the poker table after folding 20 hands and then losing a set to a drunk asshole. It is possible. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's funny you mentioned that. Can you mute your phone, by the way, or whatever that was making the buzzing sound? That, or is that was a computer? my growler coming in. It made a buzzing sound? It did ding. I, I know, that was somebody texting me. I don't really know how to get rid of that. Well, don't um, worry about it, it's fine. Don't mute me. <laughs> it won't come very often because- uh, You're not that popular? Text. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, so going to consistency, I think consistency is very important. We actually have 30 day challenges at my site, pokercoaching.com. And we just launched one that started Monday, yesterday. You can check mm -hmm. that out at pokercoaching.com slash tournament challenge, where every day I send people something to do to help them in this instance, get better at poker tournaments. And okay. there's, you know, 30 minutes to an hour worth of practice every single day that mm -hmm. will get you better at poker. And yeah. like you said, if you want to get good at anything, just do it some every day. A right. lot of people, they want to play poker once a week and they're like, why am I not getting good at poker? It's because you're not right. studying and because you're playing once a week and you're getting drunk while you're doing it. Like, obviously, <laughs> you're not going to be very good. Right. Um, also, going back to just like stillness, what I do every time I lose any sort of big pot and my brain's kind of spinning a little bit, or if I just play a hand badly, even if I won the pot, whatever, I would say mm -hmm. in my head, relax yourself, my friend. And... It's yeah. always done that. Don't know why. And yeah. it gets you to essentially be still because whenever you're having crazy self-talk happening in your head, like why did this drunk asshole just take all my money and now I have right. no money in front of me and I'm out of the tournament. You still got to figure out how to get home and be happy in the process. So uh, you might yeah. as well relax yourself and enjoy the experience. And instead of letting the self-talk run rampant and the you know being annoyed run rampant, just relax and realize right. that you are your own friend and you're trying to live your best life at this exact tough moment. So, so. when you when you do that um, and you remind yourself, what are the words you use? Relax yourself, my friend, because <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not always sure of my friend here. and I also don't relax very well. <laughs> well, so I would so add this to your mix and let's just try it. Put, put your hands on your table and let's just sit still for like 10 seconds. So have you ever done that before? Not in front of a thousand people like this, no. <laughs> no, but have you ever done it? <laughs> um, on, purpose, I mean, on purpose. I mean, I have done meditation, yes, but I've not at the poker table sat there and done nothing purposely for 10 seconds. But, you know, you can, you might as well. Yeah, or three seconds. Yeah. See, three, one, one breath. So let's talk about the breathing. So we talked about the posture. The, the, the other main go-to thing is mindful breathing, and that is defined very, very simply. It means... Any moment of your life when you are aware at that second, whether you are breathing in or breathing out, that's it. So most of the millions of breaths we take, we have no idea while they're happening, which way we're going. At any split second, if you are aware I'm breathing in or I'm breathing out, you get 100% mindfulness points. You get full credit from <laughs> Buddha and everybody else for having applied the effort, and it does take effort, to make yourself mindful and still. So if you want to get the, the uh, what do they call it? Not the, tri what's the trifecta, bifecta? Is that a horse thing? Anyway, the it bifecta, <laughs> <laughs> awareness of your posture and awareness of your breathing. That is the go-to reset. And the other thing is you don't want to wait until you're flustered. This is where the training comes in. So if, if someone does do a morning meditation practice and they practice being still and following their breathing in, out, in, out, then that training, just like with football training or whatever else, then you take that onto the playing field. And when it comes time to need that skill, it's there for you. OK, that's one among the reasons. Tell me about your meditation that you've done. I have not done much of it because I'm not especially great at it. My practice is poor. Um, but what do you actually do? Well, so I 
think I did what you recommended back in the day right. is, you know, set, set yourself up a little room, find yourself a spot that's used for meditation and try to do it in the mornings. Since I've had kids that wake up before me, no matter mm -hmm. how early yeah. I wake up, it yeah. seems to have thrown a significant wrench in that. But whenever I'm, I'm going to play a poker tournament series and I'm by myself, I will usually wake up and just, um, you know, kind of meditate for 10 minutes, sit there, pay attention to the breath. And it's nice. It's a nice way to calm yourself in the morning, but I'm certainly not anywhere near a high level meditator yeah. and I wish I did it more. Um, but it's, apparently it's not a priority, right? And you have to make any, right. anything you want to do great, you have to make it a priority. Yeah. And it sounds bad, but at this point it is fallen off of the priority list. And to be fair, a lot of stuff has fallen off the priority list when we're stuck at home with the kids. I got to deal with the kids all day. But right. I mean, to be fair, they take a nap for an hour in the day. I could spend that hour meditating if I feel like yeah. it. Instead, I spend it making content for my students. But it's all about priorities. It really is. And no, it's always it's always priorities. I'm not coming down on you at all. I mean, you the, the people that generally get into meditation heavily need it bad. <laughs> no, they're way worse shape than you, right? Um, but but anything can be done once it's prioritized. I mean, the way I put it is like when somebody says, "Oh, I got you know." Uh, my brain's too busy. I can't meditate. I can't concentrate. I'm like, if I handed you a thousand dollars right now, and the pri and the condition was you have to be, you have to breathe one breath in and out mindfully. You think you could do it? And they're like, yeah. Well, there you go. It can be done. There's no one that, that is as healthy as you and I are that can't do it. Um, so I just want to recommend one. <laughs> this is an incidental plug, but I, I would recommend you get this book. I just wrote it a couple years ago called Dailiness. It's mm -hmm. by me, my only non-poker book. It's called How to Sustain a Meditation Practice. I have it on my iPad. It's good. Oh, that's, that's okay. what I read whenever I, you know, I, oh. I read it. So for Try anybody, yourself, Tommy, don't worry. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> nice to know. Uh, anybody who is interested in actually starting a meditation practice or you already have done it and you wish you did more, this book has about half of it is specifically about the hurdles, hangovers, travel, bad poker sessions, all the things that typically derail a person, these need to be focused on from the beginning if someone's realistic about maintaining a practice. Um, there's one other little related thing I want to touch on, which is the idea of what is, a, as long as we're talking about training, it's like, it's like what is a concentration exercise? Okay, so concentration exercises are, are things that we can do to build the strength of our mind. And by build the strength of my mind, I mean, it's exactly like building the strength of our muscles. It's the same process and it's the same effect. When you have stronger muscles, you can do things you couldn't do with the weaker muscles. You can lift heavier things. You can, you know your limits. You're like, oh, I know I can run that fast. I did it. I trained, right? And it's the same thing with your mind. The big misconception, and, and the reason I'm so in tune with these misconceptions, because I'm coaching a lot of guys now, and I keep hearing the same things all the time, misconceptions and, and just errors and understanding about what it means to build a stronger mind. So the misconception is that puzzles and poker and things like that are, are mental training, and they're not. They're just the opposite, okay? When you're solving a puzzle or you're playing poker, your mind is just running loose. It's just doing what it naturally does. You're not controlling it, it just goes, right? If you want to have the superhuman ability to be in an argument with your mother, and it's an argument that you've had 10 times over 20 years, and have this be the day that it never happens again, that's kind of a superhuman power. That takes mental strength, okay? It takes extreme discipline. And the way you build that strength is by doing exercises that require extreme discipline, just like weightlifting. Takes a lot of discipline to do that right every day or all the time, right? So doing puzzles is uh, just the brain doing what it normally does. It's no different than anything else you do. It just happens to be a puzzle. The training for building mental strength is to do something completely out of the ordinary and very unusual. And the classic is to sit in a chair, stare at a blank wall, and maybe put a dot on the wall and count your breaths. Okay, counting breaths is one of the most fundamental disciplines that's taught by meditation teachers and has been for 1000s of years. And what that means is you can count to three or count to 10. The basic practice is to count to 10. 
And I'm just going to put this out there for, as a challenge. Anybody's never done it because it sounds like the easiest thing in the world, but it's hard. It's very difficult. <laughs> there you go. Right there from Jonathan. It's hard. And, and the fact that it's hard to me when I was learning this, I was like, I want it to be hard. I'm trying to rewire my brain. How the heck is that ever going to be easy, right? And so it's hard. you got to do it every day. But it gets easier, just like with any other form of exercise. In fact, this is a big part of my book, Dailiness. I believe that the, the most, one of the three most essential elements to a pr successful practice is that you enjoy it. Okay, now at the beginning, you won't. Nobody enjoys going to the gym after not going for two years or whatever, right? But maybe somebody who goes to the gym gets to the point where they're like, hey, I'm really looking forward to going doing that. And it feels great. So if you start a, a meditation practice with all this baggage about, oh, this sucks, this is hard, I can't do it, blah, 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 that's normal. But right from the beginning, the objective needs to be, I want to get this to be something I actually look forward to doing it. You create your little fort in the morning. It's your, your little space. Nobody can touch you. It's yours every day. And, and that, uh, I kinda, I'm kind of i going to get back to the training real quick. The definition of concentration exercise is putting your attention on something in the moment on purpose. A couple other examples. So you're walking along the street outside and you decide, I'm going to stare at that sign up there until I get there. This is a great, great exercise, not only as an exercise, but as a way to demonstrate what a concentration exercise is. Because once you understand what they are, then you can make them up all day long. I'll be in Vegas and I decide I'm going to get in this elevator and I'm going to stare at the number five until it gets to the bottom. And if some people come in, I'm going to I'm going to try to not look at them because the natural thing is to look at them. Right. So I'm constantly making up these little concentration exercises. And as a result, I can be in, in, in pretty much in many, many situations where I used to be out of control, used to say things I regret, used to just be somebody I didn't want to be, I can control myself. You know? So the next question becomes, how okay. does that make you better at poker? Oh, well, it makes me better at poker because when I'm sitting there and I take the bad beat or whatever, or I'm bored and I feel the heat rising, okay, breathing in, I'm aware that I'm upset. Breathing out, I smile to my opponent. <laughs> And, and I know this is what I do. <laughs> this is what I do. And this is how uh, I maintain my A plus game. There you go. <clears throat> just like relax yourself, my friend, in my head, you know, it's like. Yeah, but just add calm. physicality, add physicality to it, mm -hmm. add and real concentration. Like, so another thing I do, I have, I have a three step drill I do before every hand. OK, I sit up straight. I take a mindful breath and I scan the stacks. So scanning the stacks, because so many times I've been, especially you know this more than I do, playing tournaments, you know, you can be caught off guard by a guy and he's shoving all in with the perfect bet size. And you're like, wow, if I had seen he was short stacked, I wouldn't have given him that opportunity or whatever. Right. And so those frustrations led me to want to scan the stacks. But now I scan the stacks as a mindfulness practice. It when you say me, scan, you mean count them to some extent. Just glance them. Just glance at them. Make I sure do it it's not a lot or a little or something different yeah. than you thought it was. Yeah, exactly. But it also makes it puts my eyes on the table. That's what I'm getting at. You have to intentionally put your focus on something in the present that's going on right now. Your body is always in the present. That's why anytime you focus on your breathing, your posture, that's pure mindfulness. Anytime you consciously witness the thinking in your head, I am aware that I'm upset right now, like you. you, you there's some amount of self-witnessing goes on before you, you kick in your little thing, right? That's essential. And so that ability to stop the nonstop uh, discursive thinking in our mind and put a wedge of awareness in there long enough to, be, to realize, oh, I'm overjoyed right now. I'm winning so much. This is when I usually start playing loose. Or, oh, it's 12.30. I really should leave, but I don't want to leave. But because you had this conversation with yourself, maybe you will. So Whereas, how do you get that first little wedge in there? Because once you start doing it, it just kind of becomes the natural thing you do. Like you wake up and you brush yeah. your teeth or whatever. You wake up yeah. and you meditate, right? 
Right. So how do you get to the point where you take a bad beat or something annoys you, and instead of reacting to that, you take yeah, a second you know, and, and uh, you know move yourself yeah. away from it? How does that happen for the first time? Oh, well, the first time, well, the first time it happens. I, I don't know about the first time. <laughs> it's a long time ago for you. But like, imagine someone's just yeah. a lunatic at the poker table in life, and they just do whatever they want, and they're insane, and it's wrecking their life, yeah. and wrecking their poker, right. or whatever. Right. What can we say or do to help those people know this is where you got to do something? How do, how do they develop self-awareness is what it amounts to. Yeah. I mean, something I, I would always do is I would like imagine I was sitting at the other end of the table looking at myself. And does this guy mm -hmm. look like an idiot who's losing his right. mind? And right. if this guy looks like an idiot who's losing his mind, well, I don't yeah. want to be an idiot who's losing my mind. So mm -hmm. maybe that's almost peer pressure or something to some extent that I've somehow self-imposed, self-imposed yeah. peer pressure. That's and called shit. Pride and shame. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to ashamed myself. I don't want to be shamed. Right. So right. Um, maybe that's it, is that perhaps I feel something like that. But if you don't feel that naturally, what can we do to get you to maybe feel a little bit of that? I, you know, you're talking about somebody at the infant stages of the growth of self-awareness. And really the first thing is just no, hearing the word self-awareness. I mean, that phrase right there says a lot. And there are a lot of people that, that, you know, use that phrase and there's so many different levels of self-awareness and delusion to cut through. But the person who's just, you know, at the low end of the of this scale, who's just off the rails all the time, they got they're not going to get very far watching this, <laughs> <laughs> watching this interview. You know, that's what I mean. These are deep, deep seated things. Um, there's just no easy way there's just no easy way to control the mind. You have to kind of like wrestle it to the ground a lot of times. And that takes strength, you know. So something I always try to ask myself when I'm doing anything and I'm having a rough go at it is what am I trying to actually accomplish here by doing this thing? And mm -hmm. for me, if I go and play poker, I am trying to make money playing poker. And that means not doing anything goofy or for fun or because I'm bored or anything like that. My pure mm -hmm. motives are to make money. But I realize that's not the case for everyone, right? A lot of people play poker because they want to socialize and they want to try to run big bluffs or make big folds or bemoan their bad luck or whatever. People use poker for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And it's tough because the people who are a little bit wild in poker and in life, I think they are using poker as just another outlet to be wild with, uh, with not so many consequences beyond you lose your money. Right. And eventually those people get to a point where they don't want to lose their money anymore because anymore, they've lost enough money, but mm -hmm. they still want to be wild. And so they have yeah. to come to this realization that, okay, either I'm, I'm playing this to make money or I'm playing this to be wild and I need to pick one. And that can mean yeah. just moving down and still being wild, or it can mean having, you know, becoming aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think that will help some people get their act together if they just recognize why they are doing what they're doing. And if your actions do not uh, indicate what you actually want in your mind and heart, well then you need to you need to really sit there and look at why your actions are very different than what you're trying to accomplish. Like if you go out and get drunk every day, yet you also want to be a good professional poker player where you have to use your mind to play well, well, those are at conflict with each other, right? And you have to figure out why you're doing those things. Mm -hmm. And That's you have to be aware part. of what it amounts to. Yes, that's a big part of self-awareness is ask yourself why you play poker. And it changes hour to hour, day to day. Uh, the, you know, I, I, like to, I like the phrase, what are you optimizing for, right? So you define yourself as I'm optimizing for profit. Somebody else might be optimizing for just wanting to get out of the house. You know, yeah. but that, see, that's the thing. Like somebody can use poker as a sort of a, a, a release, a drug, a way to get away from reality to some extent, right? But then when they're there, they still want to play well. And I work with lots of guys who have that wild part of their game, and it's not going to go away tomorrow, but I work with them to try to control, contain it, specifically by getting them to fold way, way, way more from the blinds in the early seats. <laughs> and then I tell them, if you do that, think of it as delayed gratification. Then you can go ahead and three bet seven five offsuit on the button if you want. I don't care because you're at least you're taking those same chips that you were spewing away in the blind. And at least you're on the button. So it, it isn't like you can just wave a magic wand and fix these things. Right. If somebody has a natural tendency to to play loose and play wild and that's part of their 
personal identity, well, it's really unlikely they're going to be a successful long-range pro player. But in the meantime, they can go from losing 40 bucks an hour to 20 bucks an hour. That's a big success, actually. Yeah. I mean, do you ever talk and think in those terms with clients? Well, yeah, like you always you want to pick the best option available to you. And if the best option is minus $20 an hour instead of minus 40, obviously that's just a better option. But I mean, if, but if you were with somebody, you, you, you've evaluated, okay, there's no way this person's ever going to get down to whatever, 23 VPIP or whatever you think they should be at, right? But if you could get them from, you know, a 50 VPIP to a 40 VPIP and have that 10% come from out of position, they're going to feel some progress. For you sure. know, try to fix what's right there. I mean, work with what's there and try to improve it. How do you help people get better at delayed gratification if they do not like delayed gratification because they want it now? Like there are all sorts of experiments <laughs> on kids where some of the kids show yeah. they understand delayed gratification and some kids don't. Yeah. And I imagine yeah. the kids that don't probably grow up to be adults that don't. Right. And that's just a pure guess. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. <laughs> but how do you get someone to realize that, you know, some things are better if you wait well, to some extent? How well, do you teach someone this? Besides showing them math they, and, hey, they, you fold the 9 four under the gun, it's going to be better. <laughs> what I do is I get them to tell, tell to me, you know, what they think they should do and what they're capable of doing. Right. So if I talk to somebody very specifically about, let's say, you know, folding more from the blinds and thinking of that as like, OK, you're going to get your your reward for that discipline is that you are going to get to play looser on the button. If I put that concept, I would never just tell somebody to go do that. I would only propose that to them if I thought if I had a reason to think that they were going to be warm to that idea in the first place. You know, what I mean, <clears throat> so when it comes to working with clients and I've been I've, I kind of changed my coaching model a couple of years ago and I'm doing Zoom calls. Inexpensive. You can read about it. My site, TommyAngelo.com. There you uh, go. <laughs> the uh, but they but my whole idea, all of the calls are one offs. This is no package. Right. And I have a lot of clients who have done 10, 15 calls, but it's all one offs because I'm dealing with that person in that moment as they are. And, and so they write to me about like what happened that week or this is what I'm upset about or whatever. And so I don't have any formulas for any particular client about how to like some of these answers, questions you're asking me, you know, how do you teach somebody to do this, this or this? For me, it depends exactly on that moment that I'm with that person because because it, it's all everyone is so completely different. That is the thing I've learned most about coaching. I've made so wrong assumptions about people. They'll write me a you know, a book about themselves and I'll, and then I'll assume something else because of this. And I'll be so, like, so wrong. <laughs> it's just un incredible how different, like I've had clients who they're like GTO geniuses, but they still think that, that the Queens are running hot right now. So they should play <laughs> Queen. I'm not kidding, Jonathan. I mean, I'm sure you come across this. Like, so for me with coaching, it's only about the, what that person is, thinking and feeling in the moment. I mean, that, that's really the same way even with strategic coaching to some extent. Some people expect you to give them like the same game plan or something or yeah. strategy session you gave everybody yeah. else. So really, I'm looking at what are you doing right. wrong right, right now that we can fix as opposed I was to here's about... how I play from the blinds, right? I mean, yeah. it's nice to know that, but what if you already play the blinds? Well, we're just wasting all our time. And figuring out exactly what people are having problems with and exactly what they're doing wrong is right. really the big benefit right. of private coaching. Right. And then you can make progress because then you you take off a small piece of these things and say, OK, here's like music lessons. Go do this. Then report back. Tell me how it went. So we'll come up with a, a, a folding range for the blinds, let's say, or the big blind only in a ra single raised pot. You know, do you think you should fold seven deuce soft suit? Yeah. And we keep going all the way up until they tell me the hands they think they should be always be folding. And I'll say, now, is this a hand that you sometimes play when you're leaking? And they'll go, yes. I'm like, OK, now we've got something concrete we can work with. Yeah. But there, back to your point, it depends on where they're at at that moment. For sure. Um, I have written down here, compassion and gratitude. What are your thoughts of compassion and gratitude? And why do a lot of poker players seem to be completely oblivious to compassion and gratitude? Um, well, 
maybe it might extend outside of poker players. <laughs> Just... <laughs> okay, fine, humans. <laughs> um, I, I put that on our little list because those are the two things that going back to like, what do I do to stay sane at the poker table? And I kind of hinted on this is I remind myself, this is when things are bad, you know, when I'm feeling despondent. I'm reminding myself how fortunate I am to be playing poker, the greatest game ever invented, and to have a halfway decent shot of beating these guys. And it's Tuesday afternoon. And like, what the hell have I got to complain about? Right. So this is definitely one of the main tools in my mental tool gadget belt of how I come back to A plus when I start to feel a little bit despondent. It's just gratitude. And I do believe this is I mean, there was a there was a scientific study on happiness done about 10 or 12 years ago. They did global study. They did a uh, as best as they could using data and everything, quantifying happiness. OK. So they had all these questions that they asked people. And what was definitely learned was that when this is globally, that once people are have enough income or or security that their food and shelter is not a day to day concern. So nothing I'm going to say applies to really poor people. OK. That. Um, uh, that the difference between, say, making 70,000 and 70 million in how happiness and how happy people were, the money was not a factor. You know, all these variables were isolated for, okay? The two biggest things that the happy people had in common was gratitude and compassion, okay? Gratitude meaning they're, con they're, they're more likely to feel content with what they have than to feel that they're missing out on what they don't have. That is a fundamental perspective. <clears throat> and I go back and forth, back and forth, 15 times a day. And so gratitude is my go to thing to bring me out of my head and bring me back to reality It's like, hey, I'm, I'm just not allowed to complain. And compassion is and, and this is any, anybody who gets into meditation kind of heavily and starts reading about it will come upon this, which is once you start to do the internal work and really start to understand what's going on in your mind and why we fall into these um, ungenerous states of mind and un meanness and, and all these things that we don't like about each other and other people. You start to witness your own self and the good side and the bad side. And you and then you recognize that everybody has the same thing. Every single human mind has this voice going on nonstop and everyone has their concerns. And so you can change yourself to being someone who when someone gets angry at you, instead of the natural reaction to be some kind of negative anger back, your reaction to them is, here's a person who's hurting. How can I help? No different than if you're walking down the street and you see somebody going down on a bicycle and they fall off their bike. You're not going to go up to them and say, hey, are you a uh, Republican or Democrat before I help you? <laughs> I need to know your perspective on things. Some people you would know. say that nowadays. It seems. <laughs> well, maybe. But you rush to help. It's a human impulse to, to want to help somebody else who's in pain. That's, we're just wired that way. And so com conscious compassion is like letting that flower, letting that come up more often. And that requires recognizing anger and hostility and any kind of dissatisfaction in somebody else as a form of pain and and compassion means your reaction is to help not to dump more pain on now this can be huge at the poker table because people are constantly trying to hurt each other at least back in the day when we used to talk <laughs> remember that uh, people are constantly throwing jibes at each other and getting under each other's skin and pushing their buttons on purpose that's what makes poker the greatest training ground ever for this type of work on ourselves because we get so many opportunities to be compassionate to people that we yesterday might not have been compassionate toward, but maybe after a result of doing a little meditation, reading about compassion. So the reason I put those down as my go to's is it sounds like compassion is a very generous thing, but it's also very selfish because anytime you can put yourself into a um, mindset of of um, uh, compassion and um, contentment, you are fixing your own unhappiness in the moment. At that moment, you go from being unhappiness to being at peace. Very nice. 
So we have, we have a chat box here, and uh, yeah. lots of people have asked some questions so far. I appreciate all that. We've answered a few of those. If you're here, click like, click subscribe. We appreciate that. How in this age of social media and people celebrating other people's wins but not really worrying about their losses, do we stay grateful for what we have, especially if we are not having those big wins? For example, um, they're having a bunch of online tournaments right now. Everybody celebrates the people who win, but they're not looking at the people who have bricked every tournament and they're down 300K. Right. And you see the people who win and maybe you're break even or losing some or winning some, whatever. And you're like, man, why am I not up, why am I not up 300K? I'm disgruntled about this. Yeah. How do you get realistic essentially and realize that some people are going to win and some people are going to lose and there's a whole lot of variance involved? Yeah. Well, the compassion I was, I mean, uh, the, the um, gratitude I was thinking of was more about, um, you're talking about gratitude now? Well, how are we grateful for what we have when it isn't, quote, yeah, you know, yeah. worse than what someone else has? Right, in exactly. In our own minds. And, right. That's the classic question. How can I be grateful if I have nothing to be grateful for? Right. right. Even though you oh. probably do because you're playing poker on a Tuesday and life is good. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a little trick I use. But you're talking about a different a different situation here. So the, the thing here is that if you're someone's a losing poker player and they're, you know, they play the tournaments every week and let's say their average is minus 200 a week or whatever it is. Well, obviously, they're not going to be grateful for their poker score. OK, <laughs> so the idea is that you're unhappy about the poker score, but you pull out of that unhappiness by being grateful for your dog or something in real life. That, that's that's where that falls into like a tool, let's say, you know, so you're consciously aware that you're unhappy because you're losing tournaments every week. However, life isn't so bad. You know, I've got this. I've got that. Right now, in terms of how to be grateful for poker, if you are a long range losing player, I, I got nothing for you. there. <laughs> what if you're a long range winning player, for example, let's say, you know, like I said, they're having these big online tournaments. And well, I'm a good example of this. There's this twenty five hundred dollar tournament that runs every week online. That's a nice big tournament. And I've bubbled it three weeks in a row. And it's very frustrating because you make day two with twenty thousand dollars in equity. And three weeks in a row, you lose them. And now you're like, oh, my God, what is happening? Why does this keep happening to me? And then you see people winning it. You know, someone's winning these things. Yeah. Usually I'm getting unlucky and the people are spiking on me. So now we have these right. people who are getting lucky. And, you know, on top of that, we have good EV big blind for 100 numbers that say we are definitively winning in the games. We're just running. Right. So how do you stay grateful for your situation when in reality you recognize if you ran a little bit hotter or cards sell a little bit differently? You'd be in perhaps a different situation. Well, that's what I'm saying. You don't you you, you can't be grateful for bubbling three weeks in a row. You can be the grateful idea. for the opportunity to be able to bubble well, three weeks in a row and not be broke yet. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that is it. That's it. It's like, hey, I still got my bankroll. I'll be back tomorrow. Yeah. But now I'm I'm genuinely curious now <laughs> about you. So you bubble these three tournaments. What does actually go through your mind? What is the form of pain that enters your mind there? Well, so I mean, these are you interesting. You use the words, why is this happening to me? Do you actually still th feel that way? No, I don't. I, oh, I okay. understand math and that I'm going to lose sometimes. Oh, okay. But okay. whenever, so the tournaments are on Sunday, day two is on Monday, okay? Day, on Monday, that's normally a pure work day for me. I have help with my kids on Mondays and that's a work day. But now I have to play this tournament at like one o'clock or three o'clock or something right in the middle of the day that kind of screws up my work day. So I have to give up some of my work day right off the bat, which is a little bit annoying. And... Then you play for two hours and then you bubble. And then you're like, okay, so now I've kind of messed up my work day, which I don't have a right. ton of work days now that we're all stuck at home due to the virus. Right. Uh -huh. And now we've bubbled. So what goes through my head? It's like, ugh, so frustrating. Why, why am I yeah. playing this tournament to begin with? If I'm gonna right. be, if I know I'm gonna be annoyed every time I make day two and lose. To be fair, yeah. you're not gonna make day two and lose all that often because 80% of the field gets in the money once you make day two. Yeah. But um, how do I feel? Frustrated, <laughs> annoyed. Um, I mean, the other day I, I busted. And I just like went and sat on the bed for a minute. My wife came back here. I'm just like, I don't want to talk right now because <laughs> uh -huh. um, I was making videos before the tournament. The kids were yelling and screaming. They screwed up the videos I was making. So uh -huh. that hour of work was garbage. And then I played the tournament for two hours and bubble on an absurd hand. That's annoying. And then, you know, I'm, an, I'm annoyed is what it amounts to. Yeah. But I get over it really fast. After 15 minutes, I'm right back in here making videos again. Right. So, I, I take it all back. You could use a meditation practice. Maybe I could. <laughs> well, no, maybe. I mean, you could you could eliminate that fifteen minute. For sure. You know, 
I so mean, you could. Do how do we do it in the annoying spots? How do we eliminate this feeling? I, I don't know. I don't know any other way to to undo these in deep, deep seated uh, tendencies and habits other than a crazy amount of effort involving <laughs> a meditation practice. No different than trying to lose. If you think of it as mental weight, what you experienced right there was 15 minutes of un of, of fat, mental fat. <laughs> it was weighing you down. You wished it wasn't there. You don't look good when you're wearing it. You're right. At all. I mean, you hide in a room, you look so bad. <laughs> you can lose that mental weight. Well, I knew I didn't want to be making poker videos right then because I'm sure it would come off. Oh. Then I was annoyed while I'm making them. So you got to chill out. Funny enough, I whenever I was living in Vegas and I would bust a tournament, I would always drive home for like 15 minutes. And I'd sometimes be annoyed for the 15 minutes home. But by the time I got home, I'd always be happy. Right. And... Right. Yeah, how do you get rid I mean, to be fair, like in terms of problems you can have, being annoyed at yourself for, not even yourself, being annoyed at the situation yeah. for 15 minutes, lacking right. gratitude, right? right, for 15 minutes is not really where you want to be. But other people will go through what you went through, bubbling three major tournaments, and go into a week-long depression and break up with their girlfriend. Yes. That's the real world. Right, so like in I've terms been, of problems I, I have, it's nothing. But a lot of people have sure. way worse problems. Or but it's the go same and get drunk thing. and do drugs and yeah. go to the pit and lose all their money. You know, clearly right. don't be doing this. Um, but it's all the same thing. Your experience is exactly the same as the guy who goes to commit suicide if we go all the way to the end. It's the same thing. It's this this terrible reaction we have to to life. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's just like it's just so clear to me now that just being able to do that, just being able to I don't I don't think there's a greater mental skill than stopping and and just being able to be still with your own mind and have that be okay with nothing else going on. And to be fair, that's essentially what I'm doing when I go sit in the room. <laughs> Is trying to, be to sit there yes, and try it's a natural chill. instinct. It is. It's yeah. a natural instinct. Now, if you were to do that and just sit straight and actually have mental things that you do, I'm aware that I'm upset. I'm aware that that when I leave this room, I definitely don't want to have any meanness left in me. You know, it's the awareness, but it's the stillness. It's the physicality. It all goes together to being the one thing that works. You know, it makes a difference. Some people in chat are saying, what's wrong with embracing and feeling your emotions? And if you're angry, why not go have your bottle of wine and cheesecake and cigar? There's nothing wrong with it. I don't think there's personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with anything. I think a lot of people think it has to either be good or bad. Everything must be clearly defined, right? Yeah. But it's, it, imagine you do have some vices or whatever. And whenever you experience bad times, you, you, engage in them. Yeah. Should we try to get off those things? Or does it even matter, right? I mean, it goes back to what you're trying to accomplish, right? It just goes to matter down to what that person thinks they should be doing. It That's all that matters. I mean, the, the way I put it in a pithy, pithy little saying is only you know when you knew better. Okay, so you can have somebody over here who drinks three glasses of wine every night. And they're the happiest people in the world, they have no need or intention to quit. And you can have somebody over here who drinks one glass of wine every night and then they start to get to where they're drinking three and now them and everybody in their family is calling them an alcoholic and they're ready for a reform it's the same amount of alcohol you know it's it just totally depends on the person i'm a huge believer in in knowing and identifying what you need to um uh make yourself whole or distract yourself from reality. That's pain relief. You know, the reason TV and movies are the most effective pain relief we have going is because they are completely in the moment. When you are watching a TV show and you're locked in, you are you are in the present all the time. You're not thinking about the past. You're not thinking about the future. And that's why it's painless. That's why TV watching is painless. And so if somebody their situation in life is such that that they drink smoke pot, whatever they do. And that's what they're doing right now as part of their 
intentional or unintentional mental health program, fine. If they think they're drinking too much, then they can deal with that, right? But the, but it isn't a case of like everybody should be going around completely straight and being able to deal with everything. And I want to get back to the other question about uh, feeling your emotions. This I don't. This isn't quite to the wording that that person used. But this is one of the big misconceptions about meditation is that, oh, I'm going to turn into a, an emotionalist zombie. The way people put it is, if I have to keep the pain to keep the joy, then I want that equation. I want to keep them both. I don't want to give up my joy and, and you know, and give up my pain. That It doesn't work that way. With, with a dedicated meditation practice, what happens is you reduce the pain a great a great deal and the joy stays there and it's it, instead of it being attachment joy like attachment to oh i beat that guy it gets replaced with different kinds of joy i'm not going to go into that but you don't lose the joy i promise you you don't lose the you look at anybody who's been meditating a lot even monks they're you don't get the feeling that they're emotionless you never get the feeling that they're emotionless zombie. I mean, look at me, right? Full of emotion. I've been meditating every day for 17 years. Very nice. So some other people said something to the effect of, say you do get bad beat and you get angry. Some people think that may be a good thing because that anger motivates you to win or something like that. Yes, it can. Yes. Negative, as we call negative emotions, absolutely can be incentive that then generate positive action. For sure. The problem, though, is that for some people, that negative emotion may result in them playing poorly. Right. Like, because right. imagine I now want to get that player back or something like that. Yeah. Then that, that may result in me playing more hands right. with that person, which doesn't make logical sense. And um, I don't know. Be careful with things well, like anger, I would I would venture. Well, see, the thing about anger is... Ideally, like, you want to show up and play well to begin with, though, right? Like, why don't you just show up and play great? Why do you have to get bad beat and get angry first? Well, the the... Anger is, um, no, nobody would say, okay, I want to go out and I'm going to practice getting angry because I know it helps me in the long run, right? The anger just happens incidentally. And incidentally, sometimes it has, might seem to have a positive effect. But I don't think anyone here would, especially if you define and think of anger as a form of unhappiness, I don't think anybody here would say, I need more anger in my life. I'd be a better person. Right. So, yeah, you could maybe find incidences where you could say negative emotions. And I, now I'm using anger as like a catch all term for all the negative emotions that can happen. Envy is another one. You know, let's say somebody's super envious that somebody else has a bigger bankroll. And so they go out and they they sign up for PokerCoaching.com and they do your weekly thing and they're boom, 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 boom. And, and their envy motivated them to climb the ranks. Well, you could say that envy had a good, good result. But ultimately, that envy is a form of pain that's not going to go away. They're going to continue to be envious. So it isn't that envy is a great thing. It could just motivate us sometimes. Well, so then I'm, I'm sure some people would come to the conclusion then of if we get rid of all these negative things, we just won't really want anything. And if we don't want anything, we won't actually get good at anything. Yeah. So where does that disconnect come from? Because ideally, we want to have passions and be good at the things that we do, you would think, right? Because some people just don't care at all. They just... Yeah, like half ass everything. Well, is what it means. I have I've heard that concern a million times. I've never spoken to one person who can say that that's happened to them. <laughs> this is why it's just kind of ridiculous to even even conjecture that because you're talking about somebody who's never in theory, somebody who's never meditated saying, oh, I'm not going to meditate because this might happen <laughs> and it's never happened. So I just don't even acknowledge that argument. Fair enough. Well, we're coming up on about an hour. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up today? Let me look at my little cheat sheet. Um, one thing, yes, just one thing. This is just something I've noticed about people. Um, and it's one way of self-awareness about ourselves. So some people tend to, when they go into an activity like uh, golf, they're like, What's the most I can do? How how can I achieve the highest? Right. And that same person, when the doctor says, OK, you need to uh, 
you know, exercise or whatever, they'll be like, okay, what's the least I can get away with to check the box? So this is something to be on the lookout for when we're trying to improve in something or when we're trying to add a discipline to our lives is whether we're taking an approach of, am I trying to get away with the least I can do? Or am I trying to, you know, get extra credit and, and outperform expectations, okay? And I found that I, I shift around on these different things. Like right now I'm learning harmonica and I'm, and I'm like playing every day, practicing tough stuff, right? I also play piano. I'm not trying to improve on, on piano right now, you know? So uh, this is a good self-awareness thing to recognize what, what mindset we're in, whether we're trying to get away with the least we can do. And if we are, maybe think about, oh, maybe I should just like do more of that, even though I don't have to, okay? And this could come to poker training, could be meditation, could be exercise, could be diet. Anything we're trying to tweak ourselves in an improved direction, recognize when we're just trying to get away with the least we can. Like, you know, there's Dan Harris wrote a book and it's great. Any, any book that helps people meditate at all, I think is great. But his whole thing is you can do this in 10 minutes a day. It's like, yeah, you can meditate for 10 minutes a day and that's way, way, way better than none, but it's not 30 minutes a day. You're not gonna build as much muscle, mental muscle, right? So that was the only other thing I just wanted to touch on is as we're trying to work on our mental game and poker game is like recognize whether whether we're really put, applying ourselves or yeah, whether we're just trying to check the box and move on. It's it's very important to make sure you know what you really want in life, right? If you want to get good at poker, then you know you have to don't do the minimum, do the maximum, right? right if you want to get right. good at harmonica, do the maximum. Whenever I was in tenth grade, I wanted to get good at playing the trumpet because I was a marginal trumpet player and wanted to be a good yeah. trumpet player. So in the summer yeah. between ninth and 10th grade, I practiced about seven hours a day, every day for about three months. Okay. And my lips would be bleeding every day and it was terrible, but I got really good at trumpet. And that was like the best trumpet player in the county for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Cause I right. really wanted it. Yeah. And same thing with poker. When I was 18 years old, I wanted to get really good at sit and goes. So I devoted the next three years of my life to only right. playing sit and goes. And I got really good at them. And I mean, I probably did it overboard to the fact that I had no social life or anything like this. I did it to a detriment to everything else in my life. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get good at anything, you need to make sure you are applying yourself more than other people who are doing that. And yes, I mean, that's, and prioritizing. And then yeah. that's where the dailiness comes in. Like, you know, harmonica, let's say I only play five minutes today. Well, at least I played today. Yeah, it's better than didn't nothing. Skip, didn't skip a day, right? I mean, so <laughs> if you never skip a day, you can never skip a week. That's the full. <laughs> I, I have this, well, learning Spanish is a good example of this with me because I'd like to, but I would not like to enough to actually do the work. Yeah, and I will try like five minutes a day, but you're not going to learn Spanish in five no. minutes a day ever. And at some point you have to recognize, is this something I actually want in my life to the point that I like feel bad if I don't do it or yeah. am I just going to forget about it? So I've just kind of forgot yeah. about it because I'd like yeah. to do it, but I don't want to feel bad because I'm not doing it yeah. because it's just not really a priority. And you have to figure out what you really exactly. care about and if you really care about it do it and if you don't care about it or it's just yeah. not in the cards for your life because that's not where you are then forget about it let it go i let get it, it. i love playing the game magic the gathering i would love to be a professional magic the gathering player the problem is they don't make any oh. money and you got to devote your life to it and that's just not going to happen for me in this lifetime oh. right so let it go and that's okay and you feel a whole lot better once you let it go than if you were always like halfway hoping for it or something and right Totally. I, I went through this same thing. It's kind of a funny story with Phil Galfon. Years ago, he started up a meditation practice. I was coaching him a long time ago. And he's like, OK, so I did my 10 minutes a day for a couple of days and I stopped and started and blah, blah, blah. And then he wrote to me, he's like, you know, I know I'm not really going to give this my all right now, but it's hanging over my head. You know, I went like a two weeks without doing it. So it's creating this guilt complex. He goes, maybe I'm better off just like taking it off the table altogether. And I was like, yes, you are, which is exactly what you were saying. You know, either either do it or don't do it. Right? <laughs> either one, pick. Right, You'll right. be better off as long as you commit to either doing it exactly. or commit to don't doing it. But exactly. to be fair, if you're going to be a poker player, you need to have a very strong mental game and you need to learn to play technically sound if that's what you actually care about. And if you don't care about those things, then maybe poker's not for you. If you, care about money. <laughs> if you don't care right. about money, then hey, do whatever you want, right? All right. Well, great. This was a fantastic call. I appreciate you being here with me today. Um, people were asking about your book. It's Dailiness, right? 
The meditation book is called Dailiness. Yes. Dailiness. And you have, you have a bunch yeah. of other work and people can I check all that out at TommyAngelo.com, correct? Yeah, they're all listed there. Um, I did write one pure strategy book called Waiting for Straighters. And it's about pre-flop at, at No Limit Hold'em and Pot Limit Omaha. All right. So that's, a, that's a fun little read. Very nice. Check it out. Tommy has all sorts of great stuff. I mean, I, I'm telling you, whenever I was a young person, I, I would read Elements of Poker over and over and over again. And some of that stuff still sticks with you today. You know, always look to the left before the action's on you. Like that's a straight from <laughs> Tommy Angelo's book. And good idea. <laughs> good idea. Full of good ideas. <laughs> I like books like that that are just like lots of good, actionable advice. That's really what I kind of model my books off of. They're just good, actionable yeah. advice that you can apply immediately that will make you better at poker. And, um, yeah. you know, you, you, you helped me become the person I am, so I appreciate you. Well, likewise, you've been an inspiration for me, too. And, and, and let me just thank you on the air for all the help you've given me with uh, publication and various other little things. You've well, been you're very, very welcome. I'm always happy to help. Well, good. Thanks all to everyone for being here again. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most out of your opportunities. I know a lot of you are stuck at home at the moment, so you might as well find something and get good at it. Good luck. Have fun. Click like, click subscribe, and we'll talk to you later.